entrepreneurs, employees of all different backgrounds have recently left their job as a result of the great resignation. Millennials have proven to be especially impulsive. If you recently quit your job or thinking about it or want to learn how to make your business work for you, we have Kim Kiyosaki with us today. She turned her small business into a global brand. And I'm your host for this show for Millennial Money, Alexandra gonzalez Gonoza. Kim has learned what it takes to be successful as a real estate investor, entrepreneur, speaker, author, and CEO of the Rich Data Company. Kim, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Alexandra. Always, always love being with you. Oh, you're, thank you. you're doing such great work um, educating millennials about money, about investing, about business, entrepreneurship. Love it. Love it all. Thank you, Kim. And I'd love to be able to see all these millennials grow with all the content that we've spread together. And um, today specifically, um, I want to go through some of the pillars that we talk about at Rich Dad. So we've divided the ways in which we earn money into four quadrants, right? So that's the E, the S, the B, and the I um, quadrant that we have. Um, Specifically, E is employee, S is self-employed, um, B is big business owner, which now is, we used to say at Rich Dad, it was 500 employees or more. Now um, in March of 2010, President Obama um, passed the Affordable Healthcare Act. So now it's 50 employees or more. And then I, which is investor. And, and so- if I could just add, Alexandra, um, E, employee is you working for somebody else. Mm-hmm. S, self-employed is you working for yourself. Mm-hmm. B, business owners is other people working for you. And I, investor, is your money working for you. Yes, exactly. And for the purpose of this episode, we're going to focus on the S and B quadrants. Can you briefly explain the difference between those two? Yes. So S is self-employed. When I started out, I was an employee. I had a job, left that job, Well, actually fired from that job. and started my own business, very small business. And from there, I became an S, self-employed. I was working for myself. And one of the things about the S quadrant, one of the things is very positive, it's very freeing. You get to, you know, it's your time, it's your decisions, it's your strategies, it's your creation. It's very creative, very fun. One of the drawbacks from S is it can be very, you can be trapped. If you're the one doing everything, it's very, very difficult to grow into a bigger business. As, an, as a self-employed person, if you're the one doing all the jobs, it's just you and, and studies show that of the um, women-owned businesses in the US, 90% only have one employee. And so one of the problems is that if you're not, mm, what would I say? S thinks no one can do it better. And if that's the mindset that no one can do it better, it's going to be very difficult for you to hire people who you need to have do it better than you. Now, the B quadrant, and this is the hardest transition is from self-employed to business owner, because in the B quadrant, you have to have other people working for you and systems working for you. So ideally, as as a business owner, when I leave the business, when I go on vacation or I take a hiatus from the business, ideally it should operate better without me than with me because I'm not there getting in the way of everything. So the most difficult transition is going from S to B because the self-employed to go to business owner has to trust people, has to create systems, has to have an infrastructure that can grow with the business. As a self-employed business, as a self-employed person, you are the brand but as a business owner, the business is the brand. I love that differentiating factor because um, right now, some of the trends we've been seeing for employment are people are now shifting to freelancing, contractors are becoming influencers. And so their S's they are in that self-employed quadrant. And while the initiative is commendable, they went from like what you were saying earlier, being owned as an employee, but and working their nine to five, but now owning their job and working 24 seven because they are the brand. And I personally know what it's like to trade my time in for money, the struggles, the burnout. And you have a very successful track record of going from S to B. So in this show, we strive to make the complex simple and we want your advice um, 
on these five simple steps that we're going to be talking about today that any entrepreneur could take action on. Number one being the time issue that we face, Kim. Yeah. You and Robert used to have a seminar business. Yes. And I imagine that consumed a lot of your time. Can you tell the audience about that experience? Absolutely. Um, and I love what you said about the self-employed is, is you go from working at a job to owning a job. And that's <laughs> basically it. And so for, for me, here, there's a funny thing about time. When I started Alexandra, when I decided I was going to be a business owner and an entrepreneur, I had this ridiculous thought that, oh, now I don't have to work so many hours. <laughs> but as you know, as an entrepreneur, you're the one responsible for bringing in the money, for bringing in the sales. And if you're not out there working, hustling, doing whatever it takes 24 seven, your business isn't going to grow. So I found out very quickly that time is a crucial element in this whole thing called entrepreneurship. So when, when Robert and I had the seminar business, very time heavy, very labor intensive, we were traveling all over the world. We had seven offices, 11 offices in seven countries. We were on the road 75, 80% of the, of the year. And it was our time. It was Robert and me doing it all. We had a team, a small team, but basically that team was reliant on Robert and myself. So when that business got to a certain level where we knew either we had to completely revamp the business system as it was or move on to something else, we decided to move on to something else. And one of the first questions to your, to your question, Alexander, one of the first questions we asked is, we are a little tired after 10 years of traveling all the time, all over the world. What if, because the purpose of a business is to solve a problem, as you know, and the problem we saw, which we were teaching on the road, was that there was no financial education taught in school. And so in 1994, Robert and I were financially free. We had more money coming in from our investments than was going out in living expenses, which is the whole premise of the cash flow game. And at that point, we asked ourselves, what is it we want to do with our life? And we're like, we don't want to be, it does, we don't want it to be all of our time, our new, our, this business venture we're going to take on it. We don't want it to come, we don't want it to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, time consuming. Con time, con we don't want it to consume all of our personal time. And so we, des we designed what we called a seminar in a box. So we took what we were teaching on the road and we created a board game called Cash Flow. Now, we had no idea how to create a board game. We didn't know how to sell a board game, but we knew we, want, we wanted to trade a business and build a brand versus be self-employed and having it dependent on us and our time. So we created this cash flow board game. And the purpose was that this game could go all over the world. People could teach one another. So this game could travel and educate people in places Robert and I would never, ever get to. And that was called leverage. We could leverage ourselves, leverage our time, and people all over the world would be teaching one another instead of us taking all of our time and going to all these different cities and teaching people one-on-one. -on -one. So instead of teaching small groups of people, we could now teach the world. That's incredible because you went from one-to-one -to, -one to one to many. Yes. And I think that that's also a difficult thing for a lot of people just now starting off their brand where they're the face of it. And um, they don't necessarily know where to begin to leverage their time. Where in your situation, you created the product, which was a seminar in a box. Yeah. Um, let, let me interrupt, let, I'm going to interrupt you for one moment because you, you said something very important. When you're building a business, when we started out, we did not say we're going to build a business. We said we're going to build a brand. And it's a very different mindset. So people that are all the millennials that are watching, if you're starting out or you're building a business, instead think building a brand because it changes your whole mindset. Now you're not just building a product. You're not just building a service. You're not just trading your time for money. You're building something that is going to be bigger than you. Mm -hmm. And that's, I, I think that's pretty crucial for this, um, this audience specifically, because all, a lot of this younger generation has wanted to build their brand, their, their persona, right? Become this influential person and gain fame. And that is pretty pivotal when you're trying to make that shift of working in your business. Yes. Uh, and so what, I guess, what could be 
the solution to this issue when they're when they are spending so much time working in their business as opposed to on it? Yeah, that's a that's a great point because when you build your business based on your own persona, you're trapped. <laughs> Because, and, and I'll give you a good example. Matter, well, I'll, I'll give you a very good example. Um, very, very brilliant educator, teacher, uh, motivator, Tony Robbins. Okay, Tony Robbins, I, I, I admire him greatly. And he built his brand around Tony Robbins. It was always called the Tony Robbins Show, basically. And he actually tried to leverage himself by having training facilitators and um, having his videos being facilitated by other people. But the problem was he had built himself to be such this magnificent person and, and individual that people wanted him. They didn't want a substitute. They wanted him. So when we started the Rich Dad Company, we made the conscious choice to not build it around Robert, although it's Robert's story and, and Robert Kiyosaki is now a brand in himself. But we purposely set out and created the Rich Dad Company so that the brand could build, could grow and grow and grow whether Robert and I were involved or not. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important to, you know, there's, there's a bit of ego involved where you wanna, you know, have your own persona and you wanna be the star and all of that good stuff. But if you really wanna grow up business and, and, and at some point in your business, you're probably gonna get a little tired and you might wanna, you know, take, take a step back well, if the business is dependent on you and your personality, it's really difficult to take that time back. But if you build it as like millennial money, this is not the Alexander, Alexandra Gonzalez show. This is millennial money, which sure. can grow as a brand. Mm -hmm. um, and that was that was a really big decision that we had to make. And you sometimes you have to put your ego aside a little bit um, to let that happen. That's actually a huge point that you just made, because when I bumped into people, they wouldn't even remember my name. They're like, oh, you're millennial money. Like you're part of that millennial money show. Right. And yep. so it's awesome that they know the fundamentals and they know the brand millennial money, not necessarily my name, which has been, it's a, it's a huge, um, I guess, attribution to what we've built at Rich Dad. Yeah. And probably Alexandra, as you grow and millennial money grows, then there's probably going to be a second brand called Alexandra Gonzalez. <laughs> uh, uh, your money by itself can be there with you or without you if you decide in the future that you want to you know make some changes yeah that's an, that's incredible and and so kim when you're starting off this journey for example what are some of the core principles that were non-negotiable that you stuck to to make sure that this was a brand and not your self-image that was gaining the fame oh that's a very good question um <laughs> There, there's actually two principles that Robert and I built this company on, um, and most people would not be familiar with them. And I'll, I'll keep it very simple, um, but they come from a gentleman named Buckminster Fuller. They call him Bucky. And Buckminster Fuller was a futurist. He was an inventor. He invented the geodesic dome. He was a vig visionary, uh, basically dedicated his life to the well-being of humanity. And he discovered several what he called generalized principles, principles that are true in all cases. And we early on adopted two of them. We use them a lot in our business, but there's two specifically that we built our business around. And one is this concept of precession. And I won't go into the details of it, but precession basically comes down to the more people we serve, the more effective we become. Mm -hmm. So it was always about serving people versus putting money in our pocket. And so when we started the business, we were already financially free and one of the things that was non-negotiable is that we would never make a decision based on what would put first money in our pocket. Mm -hmm. The decision always had to be what's going to serve the most people, because if we serve the most people, then money will come in our pocket. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was one principle that was very, very important. And the other that we've lived by for, for a long time is, and it's a strange word, it's called angular redundancy. And angular, like redundant, what's redundant? Okay, so another, you know, automobile. We don't need another automobile. There, we've got enough of them um, that's redundant. It's, so angular redundancy is what needs to be done in the world that's not being done that you could do. So again, we go back to the problem we were solving. What is the, you know, there's no, the problem is there's no financial education. 
And so if we could deliver financial education, that's something that nobody else was doing to the masses. Um, so those were two principles that were very, very important starting out. And of course, as you know, because you've lived it, um, mission first, mission first, team second, individual third. That was also our motto. And let me just say this about the money. The mission, whatever it is, is again, something what's, what's not being done that needs to be done. The mission should drive the money. And I'm not saying, you know, do what you love and the money will follow. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the mission, there's got to be something bigger, bigger than the money. Because if, if you're just starting your business just to make money, when things get tough, you're going to quit because it's not a big enough why. It's not enough big enough um, reason to keep going. Mm -hmm. So if you do your mission and pay attention very much to the, to the numbers and the dollars, because if you have a great mission, but nobody's buying it, you're out of, you're out of business. So the two go hand in hand, but we always put mission first and then money second. Yeah. And that's actually something very big that we've been seeing with this younger generation. Yeah. They, you know, especially being part of this, the great resignation, they have quit their jobs and like totally traded in that the big monies that they, but the big um, money that they were making in their corporate jobs because they're mission driven and they, they want to be able to influence people and, and make a difference in this world. And so um, at Rich Dad, you know, our, our mission has always been to elevate the financial well-being of humanity. And I know that you mentioned how that wasn't previously taught in schools, but I think a lot of people struggle finding their purpose and mission. Yeah. yeah. How did you discover something that's so big. I mean, we're, we're talking about elevating the financial well-being. Of the <laughs> How did you even discover that was what you wanted to do? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, and I find for a lot of entrepreneurs, usually what drives them is something that's happened in their own lives. And it could be something very simple. It could be something bigger. Um, so for, for Robert and I, when we became financially free, we weren't doing it for any other reason than we wanted to be free. Mm -hmm. um, we weren't doing it because we were going to create a product or we were going to do this. It was part of our path to, to freedom. And freedom's a big issue for me. I must have freedom. Yeah. <laughs> financial freedom, personal freedom, everything. It's all freedom. That's why I'm teaching financial freedom. Um, so it, it came about because as you know, when, when we became financially free and people kept asking us how we did it, it's like we, we went down this path and said, well, instead of us telling everybody what we did, let's put it into a game and let's teach people what we did. Mm -hmm. So I do think sometimes people do get hung up on this idea of I have to find my purpose. I must find my purpose before I start. No, no. Um, there is also a great quote by Bucky and I'm, and I'm not gonna say it, exactly verbatim, but um, it's a story about he was, he was close to taking his own life and he heard a voice and the voice said, um, you do not belong to you, you belong to the universe, but rest assured you will be fulfilling your own significance, your own purpose, if you dedicate yourself to the highest advantage of others. And that is kind of where Robert and I was like, again, goes back to what can we do? We didn't know if it was going to be, if it was going to work, if it was going to be a success. But the point in saying this is sometimes you don't have to know. He, it even, he even said, your, your purpose may forever be obscure to you. You don't, it, you know, maybe my purpose is to do financial education. Maybe it's not, maybe there's a high, another purpose, but this is what I think right now is going to, be the highest advantage of others. So I think if you set out and you just, you know, you're going to do good work, you have good intentions, you want to make a difference as so many millennials, they want to make a difference, um, but also be realistic. If you're going to make a difference, you've got to create that business around that purpose and that difference that you want to make. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people I've seen, they have the, you know, the la di da, oh, I'm going to change the world but I don't know how, and I don't have any money. Start small, have that, have that purpose, whatever that is, have that mission, whatever it is. It can be small, it can be big. It doesn't have to be huge. It can be a small mission, but start, take steps. 
when you're growing a business, it's a process. It's never going to happen overnight. I know we hear of all these tech, you know, these tech mega, mega millionaire, billionaires, all of this, but I don't know anybody in my world who is successful at what they do and sustains their success, who hasn't taken it step by step by step by step. Because if it happens overnight, it's like you win the lottery. You don't know what you did to win it. So you can't replicate it. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's what I would say is, is just start small, take little steps, get in action, get some money in the game and get started. And that's the most incredible part of it all because it's, because like what you were mentioning, if we're, if we just set out to serve other people, then everything else becomes so much smaller and we're taught to do what we love. But in reality, we need to do the hard things because entrepreneurship isn't easy. And if we have that goal of just serving others, it makes the process, I guess the vision a little bit more clear because we get intimidated by having to figure out our passion, like you mentioned, and it doesn't have to be this crazy big thing. you can do a bunch of things and then realize, okay, time to take a detour and go in another route. So I I love that you mentioned that. And, and Kim, throughout your journey of entrepreneurship, why would you say that having your mission so set and clear has been pivotal? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Um, Because as an entrepreneur, as you said, entrepreneurship isn't easy. Um, one thing I love about entrepreneurship, it's I call it the fast track to personal development, because the purpose of an entrepreneur is to solve problems. And every day you're facing problems. Um, we're facing a problem right now. Every day there's problems because as you grow and you get more successful, then more bigger challenges come your way and bigger obstacles and bigger problems. So um, to have that mission always there hanging over your head when these tough times come, you're going to go, okay, we need to get through this because we have a bigger purpose in our, in our world. We have a bigger mission to accomplish. So let's get past this obstacle. Let's get past this hurdle. Let's deal with this problem. Now, again, if you have, if it's, if you're going to shy away or I was just talking, I was just talking to a CEO, woman CEO, and I was telling her about something we had gone through in the last few years and we had to revamp the entire company. And she goes, I was like, she said, I did the exact same thing. I went through, you know, hell and fire and it was the toughest thing I ever did. But as we come out of it, we are so much stronger and so much smarter. And that's what I love about entrepreneurship. Do not be an entrepreneur if problems are going to scare you or you're going to shy away with them. You've got to be one of the keys to success in entrepreneurship is you got to be resilient. Mm -hmm. You know, when that, when that setback happens, do you curl up in a little ball and get in the fetal position or do you take it on and say, because of this problem, I'm going to get better. I'm going to get stronger. It's just like Alexander. It's just like mistakes. You know, people get so afraid of making a mistake. Well, a mistake is how we learn, how we grow. You make the mistake, you learn from the mistake then you get smarter. But if you say, oh, I'm never going to make a mistake, you're never going to grow. Yeah. Same as entrepreneurship. There's a lot of mistakes to be made every day. We say to our team, as you know, we say to our team, make mistakes every single day. Learn from the mistakes. Don't make the same mistakes again and again. Make the mistake, learn from the mistake, because then you're doing something different. You're doing something out of your comfort zone. And that's where growth and transformation happen. Mistakes are truly a gift to any entrepreneur (laughs) because out of those mistakes, like you said, you always grow, you take the business to the next level. And, and I was just recently talking to someone too, that, you know, quit their job to pursue their dream and, and, and actually make a difference in the world. And I, I came to realize there the importance of having your mission over, over just the money that you can make at a corporate job. Cause she was like, what if I just quit and, and continue with this corporate job and I'd be making money because right now I'm so insecure. And, and it's just, if you push through this and you just have your mission in mind, money, money will come, money will follow. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. And, and so now that we're being like transparent too, obviously we're entrepreneurs, we make mistakes. Has there ever been a time where you put profits before the mission and what happened? Hmm. Um, the company did, let's just put it that way. There was a time in the company where the mission of the company, I I was both Robert and I were kind of 
out of all the day-to-day -day operations. And um, the people leading the company decided that instead of mission, they were gonna focus on how to make the most money. Well, here's what happens when you do that. You focus on making money, making money, making money. Guess what's not there? Money. <laughs> there was no money. Um, and I'm sure, you know, I know I have, and I'm just nothing, I know I have, because that's kind of a natural thing. Um, but I do know when I focus, well, I, yeah, some of my real estate deals, okay, some of my real estate deals, when I was focusing only on the money, I always had a worse deal than looking at how to, how to make this property the best property it can be, how to make it a great place for people to live, and focusing on that versus how it's going to put the most money in my pocket. When I start looking at the nickels and dimes, then you're in the weeds. You don't see the bigger picture. You don't see the bigger opportunity. So I think what I've learned over many years is always is to focus more on the opportunity because when I do get in the weeds and I do, I'm, a, I, I'm not a numbers person, but I, but I am a financial statement person. Mm -hmm. And I love to see the financial statements because the financial statements tell me the story of what's happening in a business or on a property. So um, my point there is that you've got to, you've got to be very, very aware. Never, ever, ever take your, take your attention off the numbers, but don't let the numbers drive your decisions. Yeah. yeah. No, it makes total sense. And, and it's, it's important, like you were mentioning, and I, and I, what I love about that too, is that you, you mentioned how you're not a, a numbers person. And obviously there's a reason why you're like the queen of cash flow. <laughs> um, I love cash flow. <laughs> but I know that you've been a genius in like being able to identify your weaknesses and outsourcing them. And so we know that that's a big problem for everybody in the S quadrant yeah. because, you know, whether they're a doctor, dentist, um, social media manager, copywriter, whatever it may be, they're specialists in that one area and they start doing everything themselves. But to make the shift to the B, the key element is your team. Yes. So why has that been so important for you, Kim? Well, and, and as an as a business owner, an investor, I'm I'm sometimes an E. I'm sometimes an employee. I'm sometimes self-employed. As I'm, if I'm speaking on stage, I'm self-employed. Mm -hmm. um, when I work in in our company, I'm an employee of the company. But the, my dominant my dominant role is business owner and investor. Um, so the key for a team and, and understand this, when you're starting out, when I was starting out, when Robert and I were starting, we did not have a team. We had two people running the company. And usually that's how it worked with my real estate. It was just me and Robert. We didn't have a team. The team kind of grows with you. But as a self-employed person, if you do not allow other people onto your team, you will never grow out of that S quadrant. You will be there forever. And I, I have a, a friend of mine and she will not, nobody can do it better. She's the one that's got all the answers. She can, do, and, and you know what? Maybe nobody can do it better, but the S quadrant, the self-employed person has got to trust people that they're gonna do, they're gonna bring people on and these people will work and help them grow their, their business. So for me, um, the very first team member we brought on was a bookkeeper because we wanted to make sure that we, our income and expenses were accurate. Um, personally, when I brought on a bookkeeper, we had more money going out than was coming in. That was pain. That was a painful meeting every two weeks. You know, I didn't, I didn't like sitting there and having her tell me, I'm sorry, uh, you're not making enough money and you've got to cut back here and you get, it wasn't fun. But, it, but you've got to know where you are to get where you want to go. Mm -hmm. So I think that numbers person to, is one of the first people you should hire as a self-employed person. Hire that bookkeeper, hire that accountant. It doesn't have to be an employee at the first. It could be you know, somebody that you hire outside. But eventually, in order to grow, and it's a trust thing, because you're like, oh, if I hire somebody, then I won't have enough money. Then, I, then I'll have to cut back on my salary. And oh my God, if I have to do that, you've got to think bigger than that. You've got to get outside of yourself. Again, it goes back to the mission and the brand. You want to build a brand. You can't build a brand as a self-employed. Well, I mean, you could, you could be LeBron James or you could be Donna and all that. <laughs> Swift. I mean, that's, you know, but that's far and few between. Um, but in order to get from self-employed 
to business owner, or even from self-employed to bigger self-employed, you're going to have to bring on members of your team. Mm -hmm. Let me say this also. This was, a, this was something I learned um, from a friend of mine. And he were talk, I was talking with him about bringing on an accountant. And this accountant who I was bringing on knew our, knew our business. She had been around for a long time. And she said, I'll give my services for 10% of the company. So 10% of the profit. I'll take 10% of profit. So you don't have to pay me. You don't have to pay me. You don't have to take money out of your pocket. I'll just take 10%. And my friend Frank said, Kim, never, ever, ever pay somebody for a service you can find in the general marketplace. Mm. He said, you will regret it in the future. And sure enough, had I done that, I would have regretted it. So sometimes you just got to suck it up and you got to bring on this person. Trust that by bringing on other people, they're going to help you grow your business, grow your revenue. They're going to have some of the... Our team comes up with the most amazing ideas I could never come up with by myself, ever. They get together, we brainstorm, it goes boom, 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 boom. And next thing you know, we've got all these new ideas and, and more money's coming in. So, and other thing about a team, a team's really fun. It's really fun to work with other people, to build your business with a group of people versus doing it by yourself. Doing it by yourself is pretty lonely. And it's, you know, it's, it can be pretty limiting. Mm -hmm. and, and it's getting over that limiting belief that you were just talking about, because as an, as an S you think, oh, this is going to cut my income. Um, what if I can't pay them? But you realize too, that if you're, if you have all this time allocated to doing your taxes or your numbers or your own marketing, that's time that you could be using to grow your business, finding another client. So as you expand, yeah, as you expand the team, you're also expanding business. And I think that's a lot of fear for these S's where it's like, oh, no, but I'm going to have to pay them this salary. And we get fixated on that as, as opposed to seeing the growth in the business. That, that's a great point. Yes, because you as an entrepreneur, you're actually your number one job is to sell. Nobody's going to sell your product or service better than you because it's your baby. Um, but there, if your time is taken up doing, as you said, the bookkeeping and all of the detail work and, and ordering this and, and sussing out that, um, you, that's another thing that's going to limit your growth. And this just happened to me not too long ago is we lost our personal assistant. And so for, there was a time period there where I was doing all of my own personal assistant and taking the car in for repairs and dropping off laundry and doing all this stuff. And all of a sudden I realized, I'm spending so much time waiting for, waiting for, you know, repair people to come to the house. I'm like, I'm spending so much time doing this. I'm not spending any time on growing the business. And it was, it was just a, this was just, this was like three years ago. Um, but it was so clear that I immediately got on the phone, started calling around, got somebody within 48 hours and they're brilliant. Uh, <laughs> Because I knew if I kept down this road, it was gonna, it wasn't gonna serve me, it wasn't gonna serve the company, and it wasn't gonna serve our customers. Yeah. So you'll you'll you're actually doing yourself and your customers a service by getting out of the stuff that you're not good at and bringing on people who are. Of course. And and to that point, how do you find the people that belong? Yeah. Team. That's a great question. Yeah, that, that's hard because it's that's a great question. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll tell you the one word that, that I use, and this is with, with partners we've been through, you know, good partners, bad partners, um, and, the, and good teams and not so wonderful members of teams. Um, for me, yes, they have to have a skill set, but it's more important the attitude and the mindset they bring. But the most important thing is trust. There needs to be trust. I need to trust every one of them. And it's not, it's not something that I'm like, I must trust you. Um, it's something that is, that is earned on both sides and that the team trusts one another. So one of the things at the Rich Dad Company is we're very transparent. We put everything on the table. Everybody sees our financials. Our entire team see our financials. We're not hiding things. If there's a problem, we come together. We talk about the problem um, and it builds trust. I don't, there's nothing hidden within the company. Um, and, and we also have a code of honor whereby everybody helps out everybody else. We have a thing, never leave a team member in, in, um, in need. 
So everybody will help each other. If there's somebody needs some help and they're overwhelmed because we have a small team. Mm-hmm. Um, so developing that team and working with that team, um, we, the, the code of honor actually is, is a great way to bring a team together. And a code of honor basically is these are the rules that we as a team agree to operate by. Mm-hmm. Be honest, be transparent, um, things like that. Yeah. And I've seen firsthand how people who have just not been compatible, I reached out with the code of honor. Yes. I mean, they don't last. So it's like, it really does filter out any, any weeds and people who just do not belong in, in a mission oriented business yeah. and other team member members hold them accountable too. So that code of honor, um, you know, it's those 10 rules that we abide by and, and that we, we don't let go. So that's that, I think that's pretty pivotal for anyone starting off a team as well. Yeah. It's a lot easier for somebody to deselect themselves than for you to have to fire somebody. <laughs> Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> Actually, the whole team, if we are going to bring somebody on, the whole team is involved in that process. It's not just me hiring somebody, the whole team, because I want they need to fit in with the team and they need to fit in with the culture. And I think that's another big part of building your B business is what is the culture you're creating? Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of a lot of, you know, traditional companies, they operate out of fear. There's a reward and a punishment. You know, you must be on time. You must do this. You must sit by these rules. And if you don't hit this quota, then you're da, 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 da. Um, our, our, our culture is not that it's not a fear. We don't want people free. We want creativity. We want collaboration. We want ideas flying. Um, and that comes out of an, a culture that we encourage mistakes. We encourage people to think any crazy thoughts they want to think we have a, I, I have a saying of there's no such thing as a stupid idea. Um, they're stupid people, but <laughs> yeah, we've, tested a lot of, <laughs> we've tested a lot of crazy ideas at Rich Dad. So yeah. Yeah. that is definitely no stupid idea. And it, and it just creates it. It's a welcoming environment for innovation. Yeah, that's that's what we want. And it's fun. You know, I, I always wanted to, to be part of a team that was creative and collaborative. And you walk in the office and it's fun and we throw out a topic and it's boom, 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 boom. Yeah, um, it, yeah it's very, it's very, it, you'll love this, Alex. Um, so our, our CFO, who, you know, we were having a meeting the other day and he came up with a marketing idea. <laughs> no way. Yeah. Where'd that come from? He goes, I don't know. I just came up with a marketing idea. <laughs> it was good. That's so awesome. It was good. Yeah. But you never know what's going to come out from who and what idea is going to come out in what area. So yeah. Yeah. At the at the Rich Dad office, I swear everyone's an entrepreneur. They wear several hats. And so it's like accounting does marketing, marketing can do accounting, <laughs> like yeah. all these crazy ideas. Yep. Yeah. And we talked the other day too about you know the role of a leader is to bring up other leaders. So yeah. within the Rich Dad company, there's leaders in in, in different divisions and all these divisions overlap. So it's, it, it's interesting, but there's definitely a team that, um, of leaders within the, within the, uh, within the company. Mm-hmm. And, and Kim, one, one thing that we've been seeing with this younger generation or really anyone who's jumped into the freelancing world or influencing world, um, or even Bitcoin, people made massive amounts of money with Bitcoin. And you know these influencers, like let's say they have a million followers, statistically there's you know it's proven that some of them make 250,000 for one post just one post one and post so, yeah one post <laughs> we need to get into that okay, yeah we gotta get a new job <laughs> we gotta get on that bandwagon yeah. and so, see, all these young younger generations are being exposed to a lot of money and I what would your advice be to them since they're making like 20 to 30 times more than previous generations that's yes that and and this is where this is where the whole rich dad company started from um number one we created the very first product people don't a lot of people don't know this alexandra but the very first product was the cash flow game most people think it was rich dad poor dad but we created the cash flow game first and it's basically the step-by-step process that robert and i took to go from the rat race and get to be financially free so if you're making that kind of money and you have no financial education, you're probably just going to blow it and spend it. Um, that's what happens to most people. If they have a lot of money and they have no financial literacy, no financial IQ, they don't know what to do with their money, except what the financial planners and advisors tell them. 
um, you know, go get, turn it over to me and I'll make you a lot of money. I have a girlfriend who had a million dollars and turned it over to the company financial planner. And two years later, she gets a statement that says she has zero. They just turn, turn, turn. So there's, you, you got to be very careful, number one, about who you're taking financial advice from. I would say, play the cash flow game, play it online. You can play it online for free. Go get a cash flow game, play it with your friends, because the purpose of the cash flow game is to is to have train your mind to think differently about money, to learn the language of money, to learn strategies of investing. Um, because for me, I think everybody today has got to be an investor. And anybody that wants to become financially independent, and there's a lot of millennials that would love to be financially dependent, um, they need to understand how to take the money they're making and then lots of money, $250 a post, oh my God, $250,000 a post, and figure out how to, how to invest that money, make that money work for them, make that money grow. Um, there was an example I just wanted to use. Of, oh, Bitcoin. You mentioned Bitcoin. So I asked a friend of mine, an economist, and I'm like, how come there's so many millennials who are not going back to work yet? I mean, you know, now they can, and they, a lot of people are not. And he said, well, Kim, imagine that you're, you know, 20, 22 years old, and you bought Bitcoin at, you know, way back when, and all of a sudden you've got now 50 to 100,000 to 200,000 to a million dollars in your bank account. You're rich in your mind. And I'm like, in my 20s, absolutely. I, that was set. I, why would I work? Well, now with Bitcoin taking a slide and coming down, they're seeing that, that network, that um, bank account dwindle mm -hmm. quickly. And all of a sudden, I think lights are going on and they're going, well, maybe this is not my future, you know, nest egg that I thought would be there all the time. Yeah. So again, I think, I think the most important thing people can do today, whether they're making a little money or whether they're making a lot of money is to start getting financially educated, play the cash flow game, read Rich Dad Poor Dad, go online. There's so much information. Just be careful of who you're taking your financial advice from, because a lot of financial advisors are there to sell you something. Yeah. And the only thing we're going to sell you is a board game and a book. <laughs> wow. Wow. We want you to get educated. We want you to be financially secure. And, and, that's, and that's the thing where it's like a lot of these influencers or the people that made um, a lot of money during the, the Bitcoin um, market when it was at an all-time high, you know, are out buying amazing cars and Ferraris. And so yeah. it's a generation that's really spoiled themselves and they've increased their expenses, which we've seen at Rich Dad, how that just gets you stuck in the rat race as yes. opposed to reinvesting in their business. And, you know, Tom Wheelwright teaches this, how there's so many tax incentives when you reinvest in your business and you use things that grow your business, buy assets instead of liabilities. Um, and so it's just, it's a big problem we're seeing nowadays. And, and I wanted to know, is there a rule of thumb you follow to set aside the income that you're making from the, from the business? Um, yes. And, and first thing I would say, Alexandra, is your business, treat your money also as a business. So you've got your business, your business is making money. Well, then treat the money part, your income, your expenses, your assets, you're like, treat that as a business because it is. Okay. Because it is. Um, and your question was? Oh, um, so is there a rule of thumb oh. that you follow? Yeah. Um, early on, there, there was a rule that we always implemented. And this was when we had nothing um, and we had Betty the bookkeeper and she was telling me we had more money going out than was coming in. Um, we had a rule, a rule of, of how to pay, we called it pay ourselves first. We were paying, we were paying for our paying money into our future. So we had the three piggy banks and the three piggy banks, the rule was with every single dollar that came into our household, no matter where it came from, the first thing we did before pay, paying any bills is we took 10% off for um, investment, 10% for savings, and 10% for charity or tithing. Mm -hmm. And that was a great way to start building up our financial reserves because it accumulated very, very quickly. Of course, Betty had a little hard time with it because she wanted all the money to go to pay the bills. And we figured out a way around that. But that was a way of investing in our future because our investing account, our savings account today, we save short-term 
until we find an investment and then the money goes into the investment. Um, but that's one rule that's worked really, really well for us. I'm not, I'm not about the, you know, put so much into equity, so much into real estate, so much into um, commodities. I'm, I'm not about that. I'm actually more about as you learn about investments, you know, the four asset classes are business, either your business or a business you invest in, real estate, uh, paper assets, stocks, funds, mutual funds, and commodities, gold, silver, oil, and gas. I, and I, I would call Bitcoin a commodity. Mm -hmm. And as you look at these different investments, you'll, you'll feel or see or understand the one that you relate to most. Mm -hmm. And then just take that one asset class. So real estate, and there's a lot of ki different kinds of real estate. I started with a little residential rental house. Um, and I learned as much as I could as I was going through the process, but you've got to get in the game as well. So as you're going through and looking at all these different things, because and, and there's so much jargon and so much language. If you start to learn the language of money, then you'll be able to communicate better with people because people love to throw away, throw around jargon and tell you they know this and they make themselves sound very smart. It's just a word. And you <laughs> look it up anywhere. It's just a word. It's free. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would do that too, as get comfortable with what investment you want to spend your time in, because otherwise you'll, you'll be across the board looking at everything and you'll do nothing. So just focus on one specific investment you want to make, learn about it, put a little money down, start small, and then go from there. Mm -hmm. And thanks to that rule, I was actually able to, you know, purchase my first investment or make my first investment. And so it's like, cause a lot of people ask me, a lot of millennials are like, how did you get your first investment? Or how did you know what you wanted to invest in? And I started off with that. Like I started off with Bitcoin and stocks and just realized what I did not like at all. And then what I actually did. Yep. And so it's, it's the rule works. I mean, and it's not, I, I set it up on automatic. So, so it's not intimidating or so I don't feel like I'm taking money away from myself and it's money I don't even see. So it's a rule that works. <laughs> was, that, was that part of the money that helped you buy your first investment? Yes, that was, that yeah. was the money that helped me purchase my first um, property. So yes. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And I, I would also say this, because I know a lot of people think when they hear investing, they think oh, I have to invest a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And I need, I need money to invest. So when I have money, I'll invest. And then there's always re, there, you know, there's always emergencies and things that eat up your money. So you never have the money to invest. Um, when Robert and I started out with investing our little, this little two bedroom, one bath house, we needed a $5,000 down payment for it, of which we did not have. Mm -hmm. And so people think you have to have money to invest. I say you have to find the investment first and then figure out how to get it. I would say the first eight to 10 real estate deals I did, I did not have the money. I had to get very, very, we had to get very, very creative to figure out how we we're going to get that down payment. And you know what? You start putting your mind to work. It works. It comes up with solutions instead of going, oh, I just don't have the money. I'm not going to do it. So you don't have to be making 250,000 per post to start investing. You can invest actually with with very little to nothing, but you get very, very creative and figure out how you can do it. And today, because I didn't have the money, now I have this whole bag of tricks that allows me, if, a, if an opportunity comes up and given this environment and this economy, there's going to be a lot of opportunity coming up. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have various ways to finance it if, if I've used up all the money I have and I, and I need to find out various ways to do it. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to leverage money. We like to make, we like to leverage our money so that we put little money in, but we have a nice return on our investment. Yeah. And that's, and that's important because it is a lot of, it is very intimidating for a lot of millennials where they don't have this massive amount in savings. And so there's different ways and there's people not do Air, Airbnb house hacking. I mean, it's just the ways to make money and to invest is, is a lot easier now, I would say than ever before. And like you said, during this time, there's going to be a lot of opportunity. And so, Kim, we've covered, you know, building a team, um, managing your money, uh, everything, your mission. Do you have any final words for our audience today? Oh, final words is number one. Thank you for watching this program. Thank you for watching Millennial Money because it shows that you're interested. And I think, as we've said so many times, the best investment you can make is in your education because I'm a lifelong learner. Alexandra, you're a lifelong learner. 
And that's the greatest asset we have. We talk about assets and liabilities. The greatest asset you have is this. And it can also, if it's not your greatest asset, can also be your greatest liability. So by educating yourself, watching programs like this, learning about new, new things you're not familiar with, new things you want to learn about, new things you want to, new opportunities, by learning that you increase this and you increase, you, you, turn, you make this asset greater and greater and greater so that you can grow and have more success. So I would say thank you for thank you for making education a priority. And as you go out there and you learn, just get in the game, take small steps. It's one of the best ways to learn. Put a little money down, see what happens, but get out there and keep learning and keep growing. Thank you so much, Kim, for being on Millennial Money. Um, we appreciate you so much and, and all the knowledge that you've given us today. And thank you to all the entrepreneurs that have you know joined us in today's show. I applaud all of you and keep pushing, keep pushing through the burnout, keep pushing through the obstacles. It's what's going to take your business to the next level. And I do want to give a special thank you and just use this moment to show my appreciation to everyone that's been following us since 2008, 2018, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's been five years of Melania Money and so almost five years. And so thank you guys. Thank you, Kim, for the opportunity. And to all our audience, let's keep growing together and please subscribe wherever you are listening to the show. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you.